After being reborn into the body of Su Ping, the hero of our story has been quite busy. Between unlocking the super pet system, being recruited as an instructor at Feng Shen Academy, completely humiliating some bullies and a teacher at Jianlan Academy, and somehow recruiting a goddess as an employee for his now much larger pet store, his accomplishments are nothing to sneeze at. Oh, and he's forced the Tang family's heiress into being an employee at his store too. Good times, good times. Quickly ducking into cover, Tang Ruyin finds herself terrified by the implications of what her senior snake heart just said. If his also means what she thinks it does, Su Ping is truly someone of unimaginable power. Outside the main entrance of Su Ping's store, he's busy scolding the two men he'd assigned to watch over his sister Su Ling Yu as guardians. Thanks to them taking their duties a tad too literally, she's been having a terrible time at school. Yeah, couple of old dudes following you around will do that I suppose. Su tells them to only watch over her from outside the school and that his family now has a personal field dedicated for training. The two of them can take turns tutoring Ling Yu there every night. From her spot, Ruyin is still watching on. She's equal parts terrified and awed by the fact Su Ping is casually ordering around not just her, Tang family's snake heart, but also the Poison King of the Liu family. Both of them are some of the top experts in the whole city, and they're straight up bowing down before Su Ping. How is any of this even possible? It's called plot armor. Lady. Returning to his own personal room after scolding his sister's bodyguards, Su Ping brings up the system to start working on some things. For starters, he sees that Jonah's staff points have increased by over a hundred points. Considering what a large amount that is, he's reassured that she really has been working diligently like they agreed upon without even thinking of betraying him. Considering how he came to get her to be an employee, this is turning out to be a great benefit for him. Using the system, he travels to another plane and raises a giant golden leaf tree. Surprisingly enough, it starts drilling its roots straight into the ground on its own to find nutrients for growing. According to the system, this is a star entwining spirit tree. It has the instinct to feed that's evolved through the process of enlightenment. Surprisingly enough, it reveals that the tree has been alive for tens of thousands of years yet it has only achieved about 20% enlightenment. With such little enlightenment, it hasn't even gained a consciousness or sentience yet. Even so, it's impressive for it to reach any level of enlightenment since plants usually aren't capable of such things. Taking all this info in, Su Ping notes that if the tree were to reach complete enlightenment, it may as well be able to serve as a star pet itself. Hell, based on what he's seeing compared to a usual Xing Yun spiritual tree, this thing should be able to produce a new wave of vegetables every single year. Next, the system informs Su Ping that he hasn't met the conditions to learn the spirit opening ability. To do so, he must first become a breeder, I think. It says cultivator, but in the next scene he says breeder. Damn translations are wacky y'all. Seeing this, a grim expression comes onto Su Ping's face. Though he runs a now quite large pet store and has even gained plenty of knowledge on pets through the internet, he's honestly pretty much a total novice at breeding. That's a wild sentence. Up until now, the system has managed to push him through whatever trials he's faced and raised his breeding skill accordingly. Now though, he has to work hard and improve it himself to make true progress. Even so, he doesn't have time for that just yet. Turning back to the system, Su Ping commands it to open the panel showing the cultivation grounds he can access. Though the last incident with his family and the whole Yuan Shan Chen matter has been resolved, there's no guarantee other things of the same nature won't happen again. If that's going to be the case, he needs to get as strong and formidable as possible. Personally, he'd prefer to keep a low profile, but his mom and sister need to live full normal lives. They can't do that if he keeps them cooped up in the store or has them constantly under surveillance for protection. Right now, the best way to give them the life they deserve is to become so powerful that nobody will dare to even think of crossing him. Down in the central area of the store, Joanna senses the opening of a portal and realizes Su Ping has gone to another realm again. I'm sure that will go over well. Later, after training for most of the day and managing to kill a centurion commander, Su Ping returns to his room. After taking a short breather, he starts undressing to take a shower and, holy crap, he's jacked as hell. With the first form of the demon suppressing fist completed, Su Ping's physique has reached an enviable level. Before he can get to the shower though, Joanna walks in with a tray of food sent by his mother. Unable to turn it down, Su Ping lets her in and has the soup while she starts talking. He's rather surprised by her sensory ability being so strong that she actually picked up on the moment he left the realm. Considering her own divine status though, it's probably to be expected. Though Joanna claims to simply want to join him next time and she can help improve his cultivation, Su Ping has his suspicions. She definitely has some ulterior motive for this request. After all, she's been testing the boundaries of both the store and their contract, 
Regardless, that contract and the system will make sure she can't do anything that actually harm him. So he doesn't have anything to lose by accepting her proposal. Not wanting to seem too soft, he asks her a few questions about how things will run if she isn't here. But Joanna reassures him that she's already taken care of it. For one thing, she spelled Ru Yan to sleep till morning so she won't cause a scene. With everything addressed, Supin grabs Joanna by the arm and suddenly pulls her through a portal to the Divine Realm. Once they enter, Joanna is instantly floored by the sight of the World Tree. With this, Su Ping's ability to travel across realms is proven, and Joanna is more hopeful than ever that she'll be able to see the Supreme God Realm again. As they wait to be picked up by someone Joanna is sent for, she explains the framework her God Domain's realms are structured under. In simple terms, pure-blooded gods grow to adulthood and become true gods, who are as strong as the Tenth Order bloodline pets she defeated a while back. Apart from that, they have six levels, or rather five at present, since the Supreme God Realm is sealed off and hidden. Hearing that this is the case while enemies continue invading their domain, Supin can see for himself now why she was so willing to sign his employment contract. Right at that moment, the divine being Joanna called arrives and flies the two of them to a large palace. As they enter, the servants bow before Joanna and instantly go to prepare the divine spring at her command. Hearing this, Suping almost scoffs at how spoiled she must be. But it's not what he thought at all. The Divine Spring is actually a bath filled with the golden blood of several titan-like beings. According to Joanna, this spring cleanses impurities and improves enlightenment, qualifications, and more. The effect on cultivation alone is a hundred times better than what's found in foster tanks back on Earth. Considering its incredible features, the bath is normally only drawn for the best of the gods once a year. However, she has a deal for Suping. Every time he brings her to this realm, she'll arrange for him to soak once in the spring. In return, she'd like to ask that he not hunt the space Zerg in the future. The space Zerg, bugs that are invading the divine realm, are an enemy of the gods as well. Suping is understandably confused as to why Joanna would want him to stop attacking them. Before she explains that, she tells Ping about the World Tree and its history. The World Tree is the mother of the gods in a way. When they die, their physical experience turns into divine power and is returned to the tree. Then, the world tree fuses all the absorbed power, refines it and births new gods independent of the ones that have passed. However, when the space Zerg devour gods, their divine power is turned into a crystallized state and stays within them. These are the god crystals Su Ping acquires when he defeats the Zerg. Normally, more and more divine power would be returned to the world tree with every cycle raising the total divine power of the entire domain and increasing the number of gods. But between the invasion of the Zerg and the disappearance of the Supreme God, their divine power has started declining instead. What a sad story, I'm totally sure Su Ping is utterly moved by how sad it, never mind. He just grabs her hands and dumps a whole load of god crystals in them. Smiling at her, Su Ping says he's barely hunted today, so these are all he's collected. From now on though, he'll keep his hands off the bugs. After all, he'd be no different than them if he kept hoarding the crystals after knowing what he's been told here. So he says at least, Rose a little too chill about this. Something's up. Turning to the Divine Spring, Su Ping tells Joanna that it'll do just fine for raising his combat power so she should take his pets to the arena and have them train in the meanwhile. With her own smile in place and gratitude for his understanding, Joanna is about to leave the room when Su Ping makes one more request. He needs one more material to level up his battle body but he hasn't been able to find it on Earth. It's the Shenyan Lai Hu Jing. Geez, it's a mouthful. Joanna tells him that stuff is the core of the god Yan Ji and beast in the god realm. She'll send someone to fetch it for him as soon as possible. With that settled, Su Ping sinks deeper into the divine spring while Joanna leaves with his pets. Outside, she can't help but be happy at the arrangement that's been made with Su Ping. The amount of crystals he just gave her is more than god fighters could have gotten in two to three days. Meanwhile, back in the spring, Su Ping brings up the system and opens his inventory to view it. Apparently, he has a literal mountain's worth of god crystals stashed away. No, seriously, they make the stuff he gave Joanna look like scraps. Later, Ping and Joanna return to Earth where he admires his now upgraded Golden Crow Divine Devil body. With this, his physical strength is all but upper ninth rank. Paired with his level 1 demon suppressing God of Fist and his flight ability. He can easily present himself to the world as a title level. At this point, even his base strength has risen above Yuan Chan Chen. Walking towards his room's door, Su Ping tells Joanna to wake up Ru Yan. With the amount of money he spent on promotion and publicity recently, there's bound to be practically an army of customers lined up. Or not, the place does look like an army showed up. 
showed up, robbed the place, and left it barren. Walking up to Ping, his little sister asks him just why the place looks so deserted. With school letting out early, she came to see him, but this is a pretty strange sight. To answer her question, Ping shows her an ad that was recently posted. Posted by the store known as the Extraordinary Pet Shop, it mentions a challenge where the top three highest consumers in the city will be eligible for guaranteed delivery with no compensation. Seeing his little sister's rage at the cheap promotion tactic, Su Ping can't help but laugh and tease her a bit. At her demands for justice, he speaks of how they've gotten the previous champion to endorse them, the key factor that's attracting customers to them. Plus, most people tend to blindly follow what the majority are doing so it's estimated that more or less everyone in the city will be swept away by the extraordinary pet shop. Even so, his little sister is determined to come up with a way for them to compete. Seeing this, Su Ping decides if they're going to do it, they're going to do it right and go all out. True to his words, Su Ping has posted ads claiming outrageous things about what his pet store can do for its customers. For one thing, he's guaranteed a champion spot for whoever gets the highest consumption rate. That person will then go on to participate in the 50-second Global Elite League where monster trainers from all over come to duke it out. As news of Su Ping's pet store and its claims breaks out, it spreads through the city like wildfire. While some doubt how legitimate it really is, others are eager to give it a try over even the extraordinary pet shop. Considering how many people are lined up there, it's hard for people to have any confidence in being among the top three that will win their challenge. Over in the meeting room of the extraordinary pet shop's higher-ups, a lot of them are throwing a whole tantrum over Su Ping's store. They feel outraged that another store would have the audacity to challenge them so openly. Yes, how dare they try to make their business run well. From the end of the table, the owner of Extraordinary Pet Shop, President Liu Yuan speaks up after hearing all their complaints and suggestions, calming them down with a simple raise of his hand. He tells them they don't need to bother with interfering directly. In order to bring this pet store crashing down, they can use a simple tactic. They'll use PR to force out info on their sponsors and promote them even further. They'll exaggerate the store's strength, abilities, and everything else possible. They'll make the store become known for such incredible feats that it'll come crashing down on itself when it can't meet the demands of its customers. Essentially, they'll make the store so famous that it comes under attack from a storm of criticism and negativity. In the Zhao family mansion, news of Su Ping's store has reached the family elders as well. They too are floored by the wild claims about the new pet store and its inhabitants. However, their priorities are different. Having been fighting with the Liu family for many years, they see this as their opportunity to weaken their rival. Meanwhile, in the Liu family mansion, their elders are having a similar meeting. Having heard the rumors about the new pet store, they've secured information about the owner of the place. All they know is that said owner, surname Su, is a senior tutor at Fengshan College and is of common birth. Quietly, one of the men speaks to the patriarch and informs him of the most concerning rumor of all. That the legendary Hara, Yuan Chan Chen, entered the store, only to be carried out and not be seen outside his mansion ever since. Since it's a matter regarding the honor of the legendary level, any and all witnesses to the incident have been silenced. So no one is fully aware of just how dangerous this Su person potentially is. Deciding to be cautious, the patriarch tells his man to keep the rumor to himself, but steer clear of Su. For now, they'll wait and see how he develops. Well, stalking's better than attacking him, I guess. Over at Su Ping's pet store, he's in the middle of a meeting with his little sister and Shu Kuan, the God of War Academy's third-year battle pet teacher. Here, he reveals to the other two that the claims made in their ads are just to attract customers. In truth, he just has to recommend someone, and as long as they invest in nurturing and getting stronger, there'll be enough for them to stay at the top of the list. Surprising him, his sister actually rises up and demands to be the first one he trains. Su Ping insists that she change her mind on the matter. To begin with, the guaranteed championship is a pretty tough challenge. It's not something she has any need to go for. With the tutoring of the elders he's secured for her and his own guidance, all she has to do is take things one step at a time and she can easily break into the top 10 eventually. Ling Yu feels differently though, saying that the top 10 isn't enough for her. She wants to become as strong as she can as fast as she can and follow in his footsteps. After all, she certainly put himself through inhuman levels of training to reach the strength he has today. Knowing that, how can she just sit back and wait to get stronger with time? Su Ping's nothing if not stubborn though, much like his sister at the moment. Must run in the family. Once more, he asks why she's so insistent on doing this. She's only a freshman at Battle Pet Academy. Why does she want a title that'll turn everyone in the city against her? Not just the normal people, but even those from the four major families and the rival pet shops on top of that. All that in mind, he's about to warn Ling Yu that this is a matter of life and death, but she beats him to it. 
She tells him she already knows not only that, but also that he was the one to protect her and their mom when they were in a coma recently. That's why she has to take this opportunity. She has to get stronger. That way, she too can protect those close to her. Hearing her reasons brings a smile to Su Ping's face. He's just about to go ahead and accept her request when they hear yelling from outside. Before Ping's eyes, the system appears with a notice. Someone is slandering the store and physically trying to harm it. Su Ping must kill the culprit and restore the store's reputation within 24 hours or he'll have his host score reduced by 5 points. Seeing this surprises Su Ping. Since he's never seen the system issue orders as drastic as to kill someone. Whatever's happening outside must be pretty major. True enough, a man outside is screaming his lungs out about how Ping's store has weakened his pet instead of upgrading it. While most people present don't buy his story since the store is known personally by many of them for being honest and successful, there are some outliers. People who believe rumors about the store using hormones to boost pets and other such things. Haters is what I call them. Standing at the entrance with a smirk, the guy making a scene continues yelling out, now with others rallying behind him. Before they can really organize though, they're all shaken by the earth-moving stomp of a pissed-off goddess. Joanna is on the scene. Stepping outside to greet the troublemaker, Su Ping brings out a paper with his details on it. This man is Sun Chiyu. He brought his pet to be nurtured the day before yesterday and collected it yesterday without any issues. His signature is clearly displayed on the paper for acceptance of the star pet. Despite seeing this, Sun Chiyu continues making a scene, claiming that Su Ping is trying to fool him. He insists that his pet, an Aurora Fox, got sick only after returning home from this store. Seeing a simple way to resolve this, Su Ping tells Chi Yu to let him check the pet right here and now. With a smug air about him, Chi Yu tells him to go ahead. Coming up to the whimpering canine, Su Ping activates his identification technique. The system window that pops up shows the fox's stats in detail. True to Sun Chi Yu's claims, the fox's combat power has indeed dropped quite noticeably. However, the dark markings all over the fox don't have the appearance of something caused by sickness. Rather, they are clearly the result of poisoning. Ain't that just seven different kinds of fishy? Turning his head towards Anna, Su Ping asks her if she knows how to heal. The maid goddess replies that she's not the best, but she does know a thing or two. Watching the interaction between the two, Sun Chiyu tries to take control of the situation again by saying that the two are pretending. He already took the fox to the star pet hospital in Shang Chen. The doctor there said this is a mutation caused directly by the random breeding and drug usage of Ping's pet store. Forget being cured. Even living through this is unlikely for the poor fox that they bam. Anna smacks the silly out of him and knocks Sun Chiyu to the ground kneeling before the Aurora Fox. Without a single wasted moment, she activated her healing abilities, engulfing the pet in golden light. Slowly, the dark purple poison ebbs away from the fox. In almost no time at all, the Aurora Fox has been fully restored to a healthy state with no traces of the poison from moments ago. While Anna gives the excited furball some head pats, the gathered crowd find themselves amazed by how easily the fox was cured from its pitiful state. Not only that, but according to the status window Su Ping is reviewing, the fox's aptitude has gone up in level as well. Talk about killing two birds with one stone. Turning towards its master, the fox licks Sun Chi Yu's face, happy to be back in good health. Poor thing's so innocent. Su Ping seems to have similar thoughts as he coolly stares at the abusive pet master taking in the fox's affection. Said pet master then turns to Su Ping and tries to brush the whole thing off. He claims that Su Ping is lucky he won't press the matter any further since his pet was cured and turns to leave. The ball's on this guy, am I right? That or he's a moron. Before he can get away from the scene, Su Ping gets a firm grasp on his shoulder. Mentioning extra follow up services that the store offers, he drags Sun Chi Yu to a dungeon like inner room and throws him inside. He reveals how he knew something wasn't right. When the fox was healed by Anna, Sun's first reaction wasn't relief, but nervousness. That alone was enough to show that his reasons aren't what he claims. With a stare cold enough to freeze a volcano, he asks Sun who exactly sent him. With his Aurora Fox now at his side, Sun feels a little bolder and claims he has no idea what he's talking about. On top of that, he demands to be released or he'll call the police. Su Ping takes a hold of both Sun Chi Yu and his Fox with telekinesis and raises them into the air. Seeing this horrifies Sun as it must mean that Ping is of the title level. Not wanting to die here, he all but instantly gives in and melts like an ice cube in the Sahara. Without a second thought, he reveals that the ones to send him here to do this were the Liu family. Wanting to be sure he has all the facts right, Su Ping tells him to elaborate on what he's just said. Sun Chi Yu goes on to tell him about how his fox was seriously injured while competing with other pets. 
Normally, it would take insane amounts of money to treat such injuries. That day, though, the Liu family saw him and promised free treatment for his fox if Sun just came here to slander Ping's store. Finally, Su Ping asks him the name of the specific man who spoke to him. Sun answers that he can't say for sure though since they always hid their face. Just to be sure, Ping asks Anna if she has the ability to read minds. At her hesitation to use such a power and her confusion as to why he wants her to, Ping explains. The explanation Sun just gave was indeed good. As a matter of fact, it was too good. Like it was rehearsed over and over again till he could repeat it without thinking. Convinced, Anna turns her hand on Sun, ready to work her magic. Well, that was easy. Definitely doesn't have anything to do with Ping bribing her with points. Sun's Aurora Fox tries to defend him at his command, but Anna isn't one to be kept from her target. Deflecting the beast blast with one hand, she uses Soul Search on Sun with the other. Seeing his memories in the form of a movie of sorts, she learns that he was in debt to the Joe family. To repay that debt, they had him inject a lethal poison into his fox so he could slander Ping's store. Seeing what he's done to his own pet, Ping is infuriated and grabs him by the collar. Even as it feels the sting of betrayal though, the Aurora Fox comes to its master's defense and chomps down on Ping's arm, which he ignores, cause he's built different like that. After having Joanna sever the bond between Sun and his pet, the fox moves away from him and takes a docile stance. With nothing to protect him, Sun begs Ping for mercy, only to meet a pair of rageful eyes. Firmly holding on to Sun, he flies out and into the distance. Over at the Zhao family mansion, Ping arrives in the air above with his pets in tow. Talking down the family members present at the scene, he demands to meet the clan's patriarchs. Standing atop the head of his purgatory dragon beast, Su Ping's presence is greatly unnerving the members of the Zhou family as they wait for the patriarchs to arrive. Suddenly, Ping and his pets are shoved backwards and out of the mansion grounds by a crackling blue barrier. Rather than the patriarchs, the Zhou Wangjin have arrived. A secret elite force of the Zhou family consisting of fighters with 8th level combat power and above. At the front, their leader stands with a smug expression. Unintimidated by this obvious showing of power, Su Ping asks once more to meet the patriarchs. Hearing this, the Wang Jun leader finds him to be extremely disrespectful, telling him the patriarchs can't be seen without an appointment even if one is a title level. At this point, Su Ping is thoroughly annoyed and losing what little patience he had reserved for these fool. Drawing his fist back and channeling energy through it, he activates his demon fist. With a powerful thrust of his arm, a giant golden fist appears, followed by the form of the very demon it belongs to. In one single move, the Zhou Wang Jun's barrier has been brought to its knees. Even as the rest stand in shock of this feat, their leader stands strong and orders them to resist with all their strength. Anyone who flees now will be killed no matter what. The Wangjin leader insists that there is no way for their Xuan Wu subduing tiger formation can be beaten, let alone with a single move. Unfortunately for him, even as he says this, many of his men collapse with blood spewing from their mouths. Despite their efforts, the demon fist above hasn't even tired in the slightest. The strength behind it refuses to waver even a little. Sensing this for himself, the leader finally breaks into a nervous sweat. With the strength this man seems to have, is it possible he's come to wipe out the Joe family? Yeah, probably. That or he'll make him work for him, I'm guessing. Right at that moment, with most of the Joe Wangjin defeated and laying on the floor, the clan's protectors finally arrive on the scene. Together, they use what's known as the basaltic blast style to shatter their own barrier and push Su Ping back by a few inches. Who the hell taught them battle tactics? The Zhou Wangjun leader takes a knee in both respect and exhaustion, kneeling before the family's protectors. However, said protectors only express disappointment in how far the standard of Zhou Wangjun members must have fallen to be bested by one man. Hearing his words, the Wangjun leader falls to his hands and knees, begging the protector slash patriarch for a second chance. He was the one who failed to catch Su Ping, so he'll go repel him to make up for his mistake. Yes, yeah, sure, that'll happen. From behind him, a voice calls out as the Purgatory Dragon. Dragon Dog and Little Skeleton of Su Ping make their landing. Still standing atop Purgatory Dragon's head, Su Ping tells the Patriarchs that he's here for the ones responsible for trying to frame his store. They can hand them over now or suffer the consequences. One of the Protectors speaks out in protest at Su Ping's disrespectful attitude. He demands to know how dare he trespass on the Patriarch's house and then even act like this towards him. This is Zhou Shen, joined by Zhou Ji. These two are the guardians slash protectors of Patriarch Zhou Jiazuo, summoning forth the dark spirit of a pet and the large bulk of the Zhou Wangjun force that are still available. He begins an incantation. With the combined might of the Zhou Wangjun and his own power, as well as their pets, a green energy is drawn out. 
Before their eyes, it all comes together with lines of script flowing throughout it. After gathering into one spot, the energy solidifies in the form of the Qinglong Jiaoxian formation. A large green spectral dragon with a sword held within its maw. Of course, even this is no true challenge for one of Su Ping's power. With a small smirk on his face, he locks eyes with Patriarch Zhou and asks if he's really sure about continuing to protect the ones who framed him. Seeing his bravery as foolish arrogance, Patriarch Zhou simply tells him it's too late to beg for mercy now. With the power gap between the ends of the ninth level being as wide as that between level 1 and level 9, he stands no chance. For while Ping is estimated to be around 9th rank at most, the green dragon before him is at the very peak of the ninth level. With this, they're even comparable to the great Dao Zun. There's no chance in hell that a mere child like him could even hope to survive what's about to descend upon him. He's doomed. Wait, what the hell? Joe's monologue is cut short when Ping's purgatory dragon and dark dragon dog rush forward, wreathed in a rainbow-colored energy. Together, they clash with the dragon and come to a standstill where the green dragon can no longer push back even with its full strength. Seeing this, Ping decides it's time to get to the point and leave. After all, he didn't come here for a chat. With his approval given, Little Skeleton rushes forward to appear above the green dragon with a weapon held in hand. Even as Patriarch Joe watches the scene in shock and confusion, a skeleton bears down with the weapon, reducing a terrifying aura all around him that threatens to overtake the green dragon itself. As those who are enemies of Suping watch the scene, the entirety of their minds are overwhelmed with one single thought. One all-encompassing feeling that makes them lose all hope and fall into the pits of despair. Death. Sensing the impending doom of the green dragon at the last moment, Patriarch Joe makes a desperate move. The move being used by the little skeleton right now is a rare one that's highly effective against dragon types, so this is necessary. Bringing forth the wellspring of his energy and channeling it through his body, Patriarch Joe activates a support skill and sends forth the molten Suzaku armor to shield the green dragon. The golden plates of the armor are quick to take their place on top of the dragon. From his position on the ground, Su Ping simply has a smile on his face. He comments about how Zhou only just now finally realized that it would be a good idea to do this. Either way, it's too late at this point. As Little Skeleton brings down his sword in a wide arc, black and red energy flowing off of it in waves, the green dragon and the molten Suzaku armor alike are reduced to shreds. In just one swing of his sword, the skeleton has cut clean through the strongest defense of the Joe family. Overpowered much? Down on the ground, both Patriarch Joe and his protectors have devolved into coughing fits, hacking up blood from the damage that move did to their spirits. From his position, Joji is practically having a panic attack. And somehow, he's still angry throughout it. Dude's dedicated at least. Even if it's to being a hater. Joji is infuriated by everything that's happened. In the first place, how is any of this even possible? All he wanted was to mess with Ping by having his store framed. He is the true culprit. However, he was sure to erase the memories of all those who were given orders by him and he disposed of any security camera footage of their meetings. So just how the hell did this boy manage to find his way here? And why is he so powerful? Calm down, Gramps, you might have an aneurysm. Not even moving from his spot, Su Ping once more asks Patriarch Zhou if he wishes to continue this farce. Would he really continue hiding the ones who framed him when it's costing him such a large portion of his forces and home? Naturally, even the Patriarch can see by now that he's lost so he gives in to Su Ping's demands. Calling out to his men, he sends for the ones responsible for making Sun Chi frame Ping's pet store. While that's being done, the Patriarch silently stews over just what has happened here today. One man alone has laid waste to more than half of the Zhou army, destroyed their ancestral home, injured four tidal levels, and struck terror into the hearts of all those present. The losses they suffered in less than an hour far exceed any gain they could have gotten from messing with Su Ping. At this point, all they can do is satisfy his demands and hope he'll show mercy. Yeah, he clearly doesn't know his own enemy too well. A Wangjin soldier arrives with the men Patriarch Zhou called for. Presenting the three delinquents to Su Ping, he tells the pet store owner that they're his to punish as he sees fit. For his part, Su Ping is nothing if not thorough. Tossing Sun Chi Yu forward, he tells the man to identify these three. As Su Ping suspected, neither he nor the three delinquents recognize each other. Despite these three very clearly being the ones who were seen in Sun Chi Yu's memories, none of them have any recollection of each other. Putting two and two together, Su Ping comes to the conclusion that their memories have been tampered with by another party. From a distance, Joji is watching with a smug smile, thinking he succeeded in getting away with everything. To make sure he wouldn't be found out, 
He assigned the tasks that led to the store being framed through various levels. He ordered someone who then ordered someone else and they in turn ordered someone and so on, and so forth. After doing that, and then erasing the memory of each superior who gave the task to them from the underling's mind, it should be impossible for anything to be traced back to him. Bro really thinks he's that guy. Hell, the requirements for searching someone's soul or mind are so demanding that he shouldn't even be able to do it all that often. This method as a whole is impossible for him to find Joji with. Suping figures out those three are at the top of the situation instantly. Suck it, old man. Speaking to Patriarch Joe, Suping demands that he stop trying to protect the true perpetrators before he washes their reputation in their own blood. Internally terrified, the Patriarch instantly assures him that another group is actually on their way. Meanwhile, Zhou Ji is confused as to how Su Ping can be so sure of his words. As the next group of people are brought to kneel before him, Su Ping finally feels some pity. Most of these people are just ordinary office workers and the like who must have just been following orders. Compared to the original culprit who started all of this, they haven't really done something that would deserve a death sentence. Even so, the purpose of this visit, apart from killing the true culprit, is to show his dominance and make sure no one thinks of messing with him going forward. If he's to make that happen, he can't afford to show any kind of softness here. With a series of pops, Su Ping ends the lives of each and every one of the Zhou family members who were part of the scheme against him. For his part, Zhou Ji thinks this is the end of it all and he really has gotten away with it. Unknown to him, the system is open before Su Ping's eyes, and it clearly states, the main culprit is still alive. He's gonna kill him all, isn't he? With one word from Ping, Little Skeleton takes to the air and fires a massive energy wave from his blade. Yup, called it. With one swing, a large portion of the Zhou family forces is killed and their home is split clean down the middle. At the outrage of Zhao at Shen Chen, Su Ping tells him it's only natural for him to take things into his own hands when they still haven't even handed over the true culprit. With his hands crossed behind his back, Su Ping calmly turns towards Patriarch Zhou and says he'll start with him. With no other choice left except to put the whole family at risk, Patriarch Zhou finally gives up completely. Opening his mouth, he commands Zhou Ji to come forward and accept his punishment. Shocked by this betrayal, Zhao Ji enters a manic state as he laughs at what's happening here. While ranting about how hard he's worked for the family, he turns to Sun Qiyu and accuses him of exposing the protector. The only thought in his mind being that of vengeance, he vows to take Sun Qiyu with him if he's to die here. Rushing forward, he strikes Sun Qiyu with a fist to the chest, making him cough up blood. Before he can follow up, though, Zhou Ji himself is slashed from behind by Little Skeleton. Now that he can't escape, Su Ping orders his purgatory dragon to burn away the filth. The dragon spews forth a blazing red flame that consumes Zhou Ji and doesn't even leave any ash behind. From the sidelines, every member of the Zhou family who's watching decides there and then to never mess with Su Ping or his store for as long as they live. Meanwhile, Su Ping is relieved to see the system's latest modification. The culprit has been successfully eliminated. With only a scorch mark left in the place of Zhao Ji and Sun Qiyu, Patriarch Zhou is eager to end the violence Su Ping is inflicting. Turning to the devil in human skin, he tells Su Ping that all the conspirators against him have now been handed over. With that, can he please calm down? To his shock, Su Ping says that it's not over yet at all. Sure, he's dealt with the wrongdoers, but the effect of their accusations and such is still far too noticeable around his store. In order for them to truly atone for what happened, they must do two things. For starters, they must issue an announcement throughout the city about how the accusations against the shop were completely made up and never had any basis in reality. With that, the innocence and honesty of the store will be reconfirmed. Second, once that's done, they must compensate Su Ping for the lost wages for this morning that he's had to spend straightening them out. As far as the apology goes, Patriarch Joe admits that it's only natural for them to respect him with that gesture and take responsibility for the actions of their members. Hell. He'll handle the matter of the public apology personally. On the inside, though, the complete 180 is seen within Patriarch Joe. He has now become what we in the real world refer to as a complete fanboy. Just thinking of the internet trolls who called Su Ping's power a rumor upsets him. After all, his power is no rumor but a fact. Next, for the compensation that they owe him, Patriarch Joe asks what exactly Su Ping would like. They've got star money, property, treasures, pretty much anything he could desire. However, Ping tells him he's not interested in any of those things. What he wants is a set of natural talents and earthly treasures that are used for cultivating war pet masters. Not just any set, but the one they used to train the successor of the Zhou family himself. Hearing this, Patriarch Zhou feels hesitation and doubts creeping into him. 
The materials Su Ping is talking about are necessary for raising the qualifications of the young master to a level that surpasses the previous patriarch. With how rare they become, they'll never be able to advance their family in this lifetime if they hand over those materials. At that point, Ping will practically be making them live as pigs. In response, Su Ping simply smiles and tells him that he can even turn a pig into a patriarch with his abilities. While the protectors and Wang Jin are enraged by this comment, Patriarch Zhou understands what it means. After silencing them, he reminds them of how Su Ping's little skeleton shows feats befitting a king beast. All that, when he himself is a simple first order monster. If Su Ping can make that happen, then who knows how powerful he can make them. Glad that he understands beforehand, Ping continues on with his proposal. If they are to cooperate with him, he can breed super powerful pets for them and even provide rare pet food at ridiculously cheap prices. With all the assistance he can offer, they'll finally be able to secure the power and numbers they need to go to war against the four major families in Razor Um's status. Hearing his promises, Patriarch Jet was utterly floored. He can't help but ask if Su Ping's own target is also the four great families. To this, the store owner simply pats his shoulder and tells him to think bigger. Su Ping's goal is to expand his store till it swallows this entire city. The next day, the Zhou family's apology has made its rounds of social media and the reputation of Ping's store has been restored. Perhaps even more so than before as even the doubters are now forced to accept its legitimacy and benefits. For his part, Su Ping is busy in his bedroom. Having cleared the emergency quest to kill Zhou Ji, he's received a legendary star pet skillbook as a reward from the system. This is an item far beyond anything even Ping could have hoped for. With this skill book, he can teach any of his pets the ability to fuse with him. Together, they'll be transformed into a being with all the combat power of the pet and more, and a consciousness of the owner. Considering just how much potential such an ability has, it's a bit tough to decide which of his pets to give it to. On the one hand, a dragon form would be really cool, but other than breathing fire, the only other special skill would be flying and he can already do that. As far as the dark dragon dog, well, he's not too keen on gaining the instincts of a dog. Taking all that into consideration, there's really only one other option. Making his decision, Su Ping summons forth none other than his first companion, Little Skeleton. After handing the little guy the skill book and making him blush with happiness, Ping tells him to go ahead and consume it. As soon as he does, Little Skeleton's combat power rises by a full half point. While that doesn't sound like much, it's far more than he's been able to gain from even the most difficult tasks lately. With that done, Su Ping opens his communicator to take a look at his messages. With the issues regarding the store being resolved, he should be getting some requests by now. Sure enough, there's already one asking for a suitable training ground for two newcomers in the fifth rank. Going through the request, Su Ping decides it's finally time to deal with the issue of the championship he guaranteed. Later, Su Lingyu and Xu Kuan walk into the store to a shocking sight. Su Ping is currently speaking with none other than the man with such superb knife skills he can kill countless beasts with his own sheer strength. It's the legendary Dao Zun, the one who stands at the peak of the title. Personally, I prefer the knockoff guild arts, or shanks, whatever floats your boat. While leading Dao Zun to a different part of the store, the swordsman comments on just how much the store has changed in the short time since he last saw it. That aside, he gets right to the point and asks if Su Ping has contacted him for the purpose of learning mech skills. Sure enough, Su Ping confirms that is indeed the case and asks Dao Zun what kind of training area he'd like. The swordsman tells him his battle style is pretty free-flowing and close-ranged, so he'd like something to do with mountains and the sea. Not even delaying for a second, Su Ping instantly summons forth a training area that fits his requirements perfectly. Stepping through a portal into the area, Dao Zheng can't help but note how realistic it feels for a hologram. Hell, he can smell the sea as if it were actually there. But that's not possible, right? To be as oblivious as the non-MC in a manhwa. Su Ping simply brushes it off as minor tricks and changes the topic. He tells Dao Zun that he doesn't need to worry about holding back in this training area. Any damage that he might do to it will be restored pretty much immediately, so it's no trouble at all. Happy to hear this, Dao Zun draws one of the many blades held inside the large sheath on his back. While talking about how all his previous potential disciples weren't strong or experienced enough, he asks Su Ping to draw his own blade. Grinning wildly at the swordsman, Su Ping says he'll do just that and summons Little Skeleton. At Dao Zun's confusion, Su Ping confirms that the swordsmanship tutoring he wants is actually for Little Skeleton and not himself. Well, that's kind of disappointing. But also, OP Skeleton's bout to get more OP. Su Ping tells Dao Zun that since he's going out for a while, he needs the swordsman to train Little Skeleton in his absence. 
Of course, he'll receive more than fair compensation. After saying that, Su Ping tosses him a glowing golden fruit. This is the starry spirit fruit, an item that can directly increase the star power of anyone under 9th level by a full level. Though it won't make Dao Zun break through the legendary level beyond the 9th, it will greatly shorten the time he needs to do so. That alone is a massive boon, not to mention. The monetary value of the fruit alone is of such a ridiculous level that selling one could set someone up for life. That Su Ping would offer one up just for some training is certainly worrying. Just what else does he have out his sleeve? More importantly than the payment though, Dao Zun tells his ally that he can't teach his skills to someone who doesn't have the basic knowledge of the ninth rank. Hearing this, Su Ping decides to offer a little demonstration of just what Dao Zun will be working with. At his command, Little Skeleton shoots up into the sky with a powerful jump. Up there, he activates an advanced knife technique that brings about a massive undead skeleton over his tiny body. As the knife technique comes down to strike at the water below them, the ocean itself is parted into two and the seabed scorched. So I'm guessing he qualifies then. Sure enough, Dao Zun is utterly stunned by what he's just seen. The advanced technique Little Skeleton just used was only a 7th level pet skill. One that adds 60% of one's strength to basic attack. It's practically the most basic skill of any swordsman. And yet, with just that, he was able to split apart the whole damn ocean. If he learns Dao Zun's unique skill, Kaozing Star Reincarnation Knife which adds 120% strength to basic attack, well, it'll be pretty damn insane. He can't even imagine the devastation that level of attack could do in the hands of this being. And yet, the thought only serves to excite him, making his blood boil for a good challenge. Drawing forth every single blade in his sheath, Dao Zun vows to teach his ultimate sword skills to Little Skeleton starting right here and now. Instantly, the legendary swordsman and Little Skeleton meet in the middle of the training field to clash blades. The training has begun. From the sidelines, Su Ping tells Ru Yan Tang to take some good pictures of the scene so they can hang them in the shop as posters. They'll be sure to attract even more customers. Truly a businessman first and foremost, ain't he? Later on, Su Ping meets with Ling Yu and Shu Kuan. Having handled the family affairs that needed to be taken care of, he's now going to take them to explore the wilderness. Riding inside a fully decked out battle vehicle, the trio are making their way to said wilderness just a little bit later. Shu Kuan can't help but gush over just how rare it is for pioneers to get such vehicles and how incredible Su Ping is. Su Ping tells them he had a friend arrange a suitable barren area for them, and he went as far as arranging a car and their pioneer licenses. Later, he'll take them to the pioneer base warehouse to pick some battle armor for themselves. While Shu Kuan is stuck on that little bit of info, Ling Yu is interested in something else. Just where was Ping yesterday? She heard he got in a fight, so she wants to make sure he's okay. When Su Ping explains what happened yesterday, both his passengers are shocked to hear his exploits. Ling Yu is worried that he had to do these things because of her. Ping is quick to assure her that isn't the case though. Quite frankly, he'd have to face the greater family sooner or later either way as they grow stronger. All he did was get ahead of the situation and prevent her from getting involved. Call them selfish, but he doesn't want her to have to face such things. Double you big bro man. Later, in the Grade B Baron area, Ling Yu and Shu Kuan are successfully dispatching a wide variety of monsters one after the other. After saving each other's lives on multiple occasions, Ling Yu even demonstrates the fruits of her training with the Poison King. With just some star power, she's able to purge even the most toxic poisons from her body. Also, the writer knew what he was doing with that panel. Watching from the skies above, Su Ping is both impressed and proud of Ling Yu's dedication and ability. Originally, he'd been hoping she'd give up after a while, but after what he's seen, he has to admit it. He may have underestimated his sister, going down to them. He tells them it's time to rest. However, the two are still plenty fired up and rearing to go. Amused by their enthusiasm, Su Ping tells them they'll go at their own pace then. In the hunting clearance office in the pioneering base, a young man is having his merit points tally for the several beasts he has defeated. The wind's taken out of his sails pretty fast though when he learns that the total points he's earned are just a little over 1,000. As it turns out, the points earned for beating a beast are assigned according to the beast's tier. From tier 1 till 3, the amount is 100 and less. Tier 4 gives 1,000. Tier 5 gives 10,000. Tier 6 gives 100,000. And finally, tier 7 gives 500,000 points. The guards can only laugh at the poor kid's misfortune as a fresh pioneer. After the kid, a large team of 64 pioneers steps up. Once their points are tallied up, they come out to more than a whopping 1.5 million merit points. For the point split, the three leaders each take 100,000. 
The team below them takes 20,000 each and the interns get 5,000 each. Though it might seem low, it's still more than the other kid made on his own after working as hard as he could. The next team to arrive is one with just three members. Three members with a combined merit point value over 2 million. When asked about the distribution, Su Ping says he's not even participating so they're all Xu Quan and Ling Yu's. Those two decide to split the points evenly, and the matter is settled there. On the other side of the office though, the 64-person team has descended into chaos. Having seen the large amount of points made by Su Ping's team, the lower-level members are overtaken with greed and start demanding more points. Rather than averaging everything out and splitting it evenly in groups, they're now demanding to receive the points for every beast they killed, regardless if it was with help from others. I mean, there's unreasonable greed and then there's whatever this is. Do none of them have any shame? As the interns continue to complain, the three team leaders finally speak up. After silencing them, they tell the interns straight up that they're little more than a drag to carry with them. Quite frankly, all the heavy lifting was done by the higher ranks. They were just there as a convenient extra team of foot soldiers. Every single one of the higher ranks can do everything the interns did and more. Hell, the only reason they're even back here alive is thanks to them. The way they do things in a team is to benefit everyone to an equalized level based on the average contribution of their group. If they don't like it, they're more than welcome to get lost and go solo. Yikes, that's harsh. But fair, I'd say. Over with Su Ping's group, he watches as Ling Yu stares at the argument with a saddened look. Su Ping can't help but smile at her honest nature. Ever since she was a kid, she's hated seeing acts of evil and unfairness. Wait, is he calling the team leaders unfair? But I was rooting for them. Turning away from the scene, Su Ping tells Ling Yu not to dwell on it too much. The path she's going to walk is going to be a hundred times harder than whatever they're facing anyways, so it'd be best to focus on herself for now. With just one month left before the big game, he's going to be bringing them to the Barons every week to earn money. With that, they have to cultivate their pets as much as possible and reach the top of the consumption list. Only then can they be chosen as champion. True to his words, Su Ping puts his sister and Xu Quan through the absolute grinder over the next few weeks whenever they're free. Though it's a grueling month, their hard work is only bolstered by the determination to reach the top of the consumption list and even to make Su Ping proud. Little by little, they climb the ranks until they're overtaking everyone even in the top 10. When the day for the champion announcement finally arrives, Su Ping arrives at the storefront to see a large crowd of people gather for the results. As he prepares to announce the recommended champion, the Liu family's extraordinary shop owner is watching from his own computer as well. As soon as the champion is announced, he'll spread their name across all of Longjiang City so they can't have a moment of peace. In another facility, a pair of kneeling individuals are watching the results as well. Speaking to a seated figure in front of them, they ask him, their patriarch, if they can do a certain something if they meet this person in a match. Yeah, that's not ominous at all. The much-anticipated 52nd Global Elite League has finally arrived. With the day of the competition beginning, the announcer declares the primary rounds officially open. As the crowd goes wild with excitement over the spectacle they're about to watch, the announcer speaks up once more, silencing them as they hang off his every word. He should be a school teacher. The announcer calls out for the contestants to step into the arena. As gates all over the place open to reveal said contestants, many of them are recognized at once. Su Ling Yu, the battle pet master of Fengshan College. Lu Fengshan of the Jianlan Academy. The shepherd's children. The Tang family's children. They're all here. And the last two don't get individual intros cause screw em. While they're stepping onto the field to the cheers of the crowd, the announcer explains how this stage will be working. Because of the number of contestants this year being quite large, the primaries will be split up between 30 different arenas at the same time. In this particular field, there are a thousand contestants at once. As they enter the field, the gates behind them are closed and a double-layered energy shield and force field are both activated to protect the spectator stands from any stray attacks. With that out of the way, the challenge for the primary is finally announced. A giant container up above opens its gates as a massive swarm buzzes out. It's a swarm knockout. The monsters that have been released from the container are phantom butterfly bees. Known for being unpredictable and vicious, they're some of the most dangerous monsters of the fifth rank. The rules for this swarm knockout are simple. The contestants must survive a swarm of these phantom butterflies which can paralyze with a single sting. Sound simple enough? Well, it's not. They must survive the swarm for six hours without any breaks or other benefits. Many of the contestants instantly despair upon hearing this and start running around while one calls for his mommy. Jesus man, have some dignity. That one dude's just embarrassing. The announcer tells the players to bring out their own battle pets if they wish to get through this. Meanwhile, 
Suping finds himself in a less than comfortable situation. And that's describing it generously. He's stuck sitting in between the seats of Fengshan College's VP, Dong Ming Song and Jian Lan College's VP, Zhou Yunchen. And the two are determined to fight over him like a pair of schoolgirls who just got their first crush. Zhou Yunchen is particularly determined to suck up to Su Ping after the complete and utter humiliation he dished out to Jian Lan's troublemakers last time he was there. Watch the last part if you haven't. While the two VPs are arguing over Zhou Yunchen's blatant attempts to recruit Su Ping away from Fengshan, Ping suddenly realizes something. Turning to Dong Ming Song, he asked a question that's been plaguing him recently. Despite his status as a teacher at Fengshan, Su Ping hasn't actually come in to give a lecture for quite some time due to his personal responsibilities. Between that and him still using his status to get training materials, Ping suspects his instructor rating is pretty bad by now. Ming Song, however, tells him this is not the case at all. Even if he doesn't come in for lectures, Su Ping's reputation and feats alone bring a heightened level of prestige to the academy. On top of that, many of their students are customers of his store and their star pets have greatly improved. That alone has made things much easier for the other teachers, since the students are more competent too. Taking that into consideration, Dong Ming reveals he's been planning to assign Su Ping as the director of a new department they'll be opening. The cultivation department, if Su Ping so requires, it can dedicate half the school's resources to just his department at a moment's notice. On top of not needing to take classes, Su Ping will only need to cultivate star pets for the school, something he already does at his store anyways. As the two share a gleeful cackle over this plan, Zhou Yunchen watches on, furious that he didn't think of such an offer first. Ain't he thirsty for our boy man? Down in the field, the announcer has just explained that contestants who fail to participate or are unable to move will be taken out of the field by their medical staff. Anything that harms the staff will also result in the responsible contestant's disqualification. Said staff consists of, wait, are those a couple of goddamn bell sprouts? With all the rules explained, the game now officially begins. Several contestants are taken out almost instantly, unable to keep up with the swarm's natural speed. On the other hand, one particular player is gracefully dodging and weaving through the swarm's attacks with nothing more than her own agility. This is, of course, Su Lingyu. As she evades the bees, Lingyu notices that the swarm is actively avoiding the grass flowers of the medical staff. Yeah, grass flowers, sure. On the opposite end of the spectrum from Lingyu's tactic, another contestant is using his own strength and fire abilities to knock the swarm away from him whenever they get close. Unfortunately, that's the wrong move. The sheer number of bees quickly overwhelms him and he's carted away by the medical staff. Lingyu has been observing all of this and has come to a conclusion. The odds for this game are heavily stacked against the contestants, so much so that it's quite obvious the true goal isn't actually to display combat power but something else. Yeah, you sure displayed something else with that last panel. Good lord. Dashing towards the bell sprouts, sorry, grass flowers that are carting away the last guy to fall, she confirms her theory. The swarm automatically ignores the grass flowers and leaves them alone. For identification on such an accurate level, Lingyu is certain there are only two possibilities, and she's already ruled one of them out earlier with her sensing capabilities so there's only one left. The grass flowers must have some sort of secret treasure that repels the bees. If that's the case, her best bet is to retrieve sent treasure and just sit the rest of the test out using it. Right as she's closing in on them, a sudden attack comes at her from behind. The children of the Tang family have shot her with unique family weapons that have deadly poisonous properties. From their spots in the stands, Zhou Yunchen and Ming Song are both panicking at the threat to Su Ping's sister. This proves unnecessary though. Using a secret technique of the Tang family itself taught to her by Snake Heart, Lin Yu dodges the weapons and launches such a vicious kick that it blows apart a chunk of the swarm and continues to strike down the Tang children. Yeesh, Snake Heart taught her some serious stuff. With that taken care of, Ling Yu turns to see the grass flowers have left. Even so, she's certain there are more repelling treasures hidden somewhere in the field. Now that she knows that, it's just a matter of finding them. As the minutes tick by, people are finding more and more ways to protect themselves from the phantom bee swarm. One contestant in particular is using his flame frog cultivated by Su Ping's store to create a firewall around him. Thanks to this wall, the bees are unable to get through to attack him. As other contestants beg to be led into his circle, the boy simply turns them down saying he can't trust that they won't turn on him later. Such is the vicious dog-eat-dog -dog reality of the Global Elite League. Meanwhile, Su Lingyu has gone on to search the entire arena, but has yet to find any other insect-repellent treasures. Suddenly, she has a suspicion and turns to confirm it. Could the treasure be hidden among the swarm itself? If that's the case, she should be able to sense it with star power. 
True to her suspicion, the insect repellent treasure is indeed hidden on one of the phantom bees themselves. Leaping off the ground with a burst of speed and power, she flies at the particular bee with the treasure and catches it by the wings. Moving swiftly now that she's in the middle of the swarm, Lin Yu plucks the creature's wings clean off and reveals the prize beneath. A ring with the properties of an insect repelling secret treasure. Now that it's in her possession, Lin Yu grabs the thing and puts it on. With this, the competition's announcer speaks out for all to hear. He declares that after just one hour, someone has figured out the correct way to clear this primary. After hearing this and looking over to see just what exactly Ling Yu has done, many of the contestants feel an intense bout of frustration. This whole time they've been avoiding and killing bees, there may have been such rings inside the ones they defeated. So many of them might have already had the chance to pass and missed it. Stay salty losers, she's just better. From their spots in the stands, Zhou Yunchen and Ming Song are both amazed by Ling Yu's achievements. Not only did she display a technique taught by Snake Heart, she was also the first to pass the primary. And that's not even to mention the generally impressive capabilities she's been displaying the whole time. Sometime later, several players have followed in Lingyu's footsteps and secured rings that protect them from the swarm. At the announcer's instruction, all such contestants begin moving out of the field so they can go prepare for the group arena in three days' time. For her part, Lingyu's just happy that things got wrapped up early on. If the rings were discovered much later, everyone would have already been disqualified from the swarm's paralysis. Now, she's excited to get home and tell her mom about everything that's happened, and that she's safe. Unfortunately, she's not going to be able to leave just yet. From behind her, another contestant appears and declares that it's his turn now with the Tang family out of the way. Summoning his pet, a demon claw beast, he activates its special ability, Hack Blood Extraction. All around the two contestants, the phantom bee swarm gathers and takes on a sinister red hue. Despite Ling Yu having the insect repellent ring, the swarm viciously starts attacking her. So much for it being a fair contest, what the hell? Facing the guy responsible for this attack, Lin Yu starts explaining the ability that's been used, the secret of Mugia which makes star pets with low willpower go into a bloodthirsty frenzy. On top of that, she's been marked as the target of their attacks. Though the other guy is surprised that she knows all that, he's certain it won't make a difference. After all, what can she even do in this situation? Oh boy, something tells me you do not want the answer to that question. Noticing what's happening with them, the announcer and the crowd alike condemn this contestant for blatantly targeting another competitor when it's not a battle trial. Despite the condemnation though, there's technically no rule that forbids players from attacking each other. As such, they can't really stop him in an official capacity. Seeing no other way to end this effectively, Ling Yu finally brings out the star pet she's been keeping hidden up until now and have a secret ace. As her pet comes forward, a giant pillar of fire shoots up and blows back the incoming swarm. Her pet, the Phantom Flame, has just launched a Fire Dragon Scroll explosion. Despite being a bit shaken by the appearance of this pet, Ling Yu's opponent is confident he can still overwhelm her with the Phantom Beast Swarm. That is until he loses his absolute marbles as several snakes coil around him and restrict his movement. As he screams for his pet to help him, Ling Yu calmly walks up to the man who's flailing against nothing in the eyes of everyone else. Her pet's technique, Dreamcast Casting Voyage, is responsible for the illusion he's currently seeing. Lin Yu plucks his insect repellent ring right off his fingers and walks away as the swarm sets upon his paralyzed form. This, fighting fire with fire, is one of the most important lessons taught to her by her brother.